Well, hello there. Good evening, good people. Hi, I'm Jason Green Country Agriculture. If you're joining me, it means it's Wednesday, 7.30 p.m., and it's time for another live stream. Hi, let me get some coffee in me real quick. Mm. Hello out there. We're going to wait for the you know, commercials to get done, and while we're doing that, let me uh, get our, our chat bot signed on. We will know that the chatbot has joined the channel by typing in exclamation point right, bot. And if he's here, he will report for duty. Which might take a while. Maybe possibly. Alrighty, so just before people started to come on, I was looking at uh, looking at the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World on the History Channel. And this is the this is the enumeration that there used to be used to be. Number one, Great Pyramid of Giza, Egypt. Number two, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Those aren't around anymore. Number three, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia. Is that one still around? I know the Acropolis is still around. Number four, the Temple of Artemis at Eph Ephesus. I'm sure that one's still around. Number five, the Mausoleum, Mausoleum at Carnassus. Never saw that. Number six, the Colossus of Rhodes. Number seven, Lighthouse of Alexandria. It's long gone. But there are still, there are still things out there. Still ancient wonders, things that we can look at and scratch our heads and go, hmm, how did those people manage to do that? Thank you, Vicky. Vicky came over from Rep Nurse One. Moon Sprance is here, wrapping up dinner and listening. Nice. I'd like some dinner. How about it, cat? You want to be dinner? No? Okay. So many, many, many still um, I can't talk. Many wonderful things still out there in the world. Of course, the Pyramid of Giza is still there, and we can look at it and go, wow, that's that's huge. It's almost 500 foot tall, 13 acres across at the base, and that's that's an amazing thing that was left behind by people of an ancient time. Uh, hello, Chef Rod. Rod Stevens is with us tonight. Of course, it's not the only pyramid in the world. The largest pyramid in the world is down there in the Yucatan of either Aztec or Mayan construction, I believe. And uh, the, the largest across at the base is actually in North America. People might not realize this, but there's a place in uh, Illinois called Monk's Mound, 14 acres at the base, a four-step pyramid structure, but it only goes up to 100 feet. So it's, it's a quite a bit shorter than the Pyramid in Giza. And it's all made out of earth. If there was any stone there, they've been carried away a long time ago. But imagine the amount of work that it would take for people carrying basket full of, after basket full of, of, of dirt to pile up to build what they're calling a, a mound. And of course, whenever we start using that terminology, we may as well refer to the pyramids at Giza as just being mounds of stone because they really are quite something. Of course, down there in the Andes Mountains, we had people quarrying hard, the hardest stone imaginable and transporting it hundreds of miles up mountain tracks that are so narrow that a goat could fall off of them. And then still somehow managing to fit those together with, with absolute precision under conditions where the air is so thin that just walking for five minutes will leave you breathless. But what is our civilization going to do? What is our legacy going to be? What will we leave behind when we're no longer here on Earth? And that's that's today's topic. What are we going to leave behind? Well, we could leave behind. We could be leave behind a, a bunch of junk. That's always a possibility. It looks like we might. I don't know if future civilizations are going to be digging through our our refuse heaps, marveling at the trash that we leave. That is possible. I was looking at a list of 
things and how long it takes for them to decompose. Interesting enough, in, yeah, interestingly enough, most of our, our steel and aluminum won't last more than about 500 years before it's gone. Mary says loading. I don't, uh, internet seems to be kind of slow here today. I don't know why. About 500 years and all of the steel and aluminum are gone. Uh, a couple hundred years to get rid of a few other things. Plastics, oddly enough, they do decompose with sunlight, but if you bury them in a uh, in a landfill, they don't decompose very well. Apparently, it takes sunlight, ultraviolet light on plastics to cause them to decay. Hello, Rusty Pepper. Of course, this is the reason why if you buy a, a nice food-grade bucket, and bring it home, but forget and leave it outside. After about two or three years, it starts to crumble and fall apart. Uh, Sasquatch Red, I think, probably has the, the 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 biggest legacy that we have to leave behind, which is a nuclear radiated wasteland. And we don't even have to engage in nuclear war to have that happen, because the process of generating nuclear power produces spent fuel rods. Those spent fuel rods have to be stored in above ground storage pools covered with water, but they're so hot that even though they're not hot enough to produce enough steam to generate power, they're hot enough to cause those pools to evaporate. So they have to continuously pump water into the pools to keep the rods cool because if they ever get exposed to air, they will catch on fire and the radioactive ash will be picked up, swept over the world by the jet stream, killing everything in its path. Lovely. This 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 may be our civilization's legacy that we pass on. An uninhabitable zone all the way around the planet. What a cheery thought. And only because um, people want to drive electric cars. The demand for the electric car just may well kill the planet. That's a disturbing thought. Well, the alternative is to burn coal. Most of our electrical power, if it's not from, from nuclear power, comes from burning coal. So whenever you plug in your electric car, about 80% of that comes from nice coal burning. You're running your electric car in coal. You may as well just have a steam-powered car. Actually, it's probably not a bad idea, steam-powered cars. Vicky says the Western Hemisphere pyramids were built only by human labor. No beasts of burden available. That's an interesting thought. But we don't really know about uh, about the the uh, the Egyptian pyramids either. Maybe that was all human labor too. We just really don't know. Hello, Rusty Pepper. Hello, Lisa Kukula. Hello, Nightbot. Nightbot, we're reminding us, of course, that the only difference between a problem and an opportunity is choice, and the choice is yours. We programmed some new commands into Nightbot. Uh, on Monday, I didn't get the entire vocabulary in there, but if you if you have questions about gardening terms or terminology or vocabulary words, you can put the question mark in with the comment, follow it by the word. Uh, for example, we could type in a question mark and ask what carbon is, just like so. And Nightbot should, after a moment, give us a definition for, for what carbon is. Vicky says, I read about 30 years ago that much of our skin cancer is caused by photodegradation of synthetics in our bodies. That's that's highly disturbing. Eek. <laughs> uh, Sasquatch says, I heard the plastic and other waste buried will be changed into new minerals and compounds. Well, maybe one of these days, whenever the section of crust that they're on in the landfill subsides underneath another piece of crust and it goes down into the mantle and then gets superheated then recycled into something else could be i doubt it's going to happen just sitting in the landfill though um so nightbot tells us the carbon is the most fundamental but fundamental should be fundamental of building blocks or as most fundamental building blocks of all life on planet earth the cycling of carbon from one organism to another is what supports life as we know it see also sequestration um and it is absolutely true that in this in this weird weird time that we're living in people are looking at at some of the the basic building blocks of life and calling them pollutants and producing real serious dangerous pollutants and 
not seeming to really care that we don't have any way of, of dealing with them. It's a little bit disturbing. Sasgrass Red says, hey, we could desalinate ocean water and get hydrogen and clean water. Use the hydrogen to run the stuff that we so dearly need. See how I changed the word there so that <clears throat> we don't get a, 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 a strike for ads. <laughs> uh, how, do you, how do you fix leggy seedlings? Um, take them and put them out in the sun for a little bit. Let them get used to some real weather. Uh, blow a fan over them so they're used to wobbling back and forth. Don't leave them out in the sun all day. They're not ready for it. Um, but you, you do have to start exposing them to more uh, outdoor situations. Um, you can prevent leg leggy seedlings a lot better than you can fix them once they're leggy. Preventing means just getting your light source closer to them. So if you've got your, your lights up here and your seedlings down here, your seedlings will have a tendency to be leggy, but you can bring the light down closer and then raise it as the seedlings develop. And that does help prevent leggy seedlings. Usually it's just they're not getting enough light and not enough movement. So blowing a fan across your, your seedling start area helps. It helps a lot, surprisingly. All right, what what is the legacy that we will leave behind uh, let's see. Battle the algorithm. <laughs> Hit the thumbs up button. There you go. Well, that's that's what Nightbutt does on a timer. He says, welcome to the stream. Don't forget to hit the... Or the, you know, doesn't matter. Pick one. All right. I don't think we're, we're going to be building the next Great Wall of China. I don't think I don't think that's going to be something that we have happen. It might. Maybe we'll have the Great Wall of North America. Who knows? Something that can be seen from outer space. It's probably not likely that we're going to be finding four or five hundred ton stone blocks, coring them and stacking them up, and leaving those for people to find. It's just probably not going to happen. But. There's one possible legacy that I think we might be able to leave, and it's within our capability of doing so. so we, we, have to, we have to look for things that we can actually do. We might possibly plant the next great rainforest. I know it sounds weird, the idea of planting a rainforest, but if you go down to South America and you look at the Amazon, Amazon River Basin, and you look at the, 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 the trees and the other plants that were planted in the Amazon River Basin, you'll discover that a large number of these were planted deliberately at one time. And what we're seeing is the Amazon rainforest is just the overgrown aftermath of a civilization that decided that they were going to plant a forest. And they planted it to feed themselves, of course. And we know it was the civilization that did it because whenever we start digging into these little islands and pockets and looking at the soil underneath, we find the terra preta. 10, 15 feet even of soil built by man over a great long period of time where the trees have grown up. All right, Sassafras Red says, we've been doing all that stuff with hardening them off. The weather hasn't helped in the greenhouse. Yeah, that's... Once the weather turns a certain direction, the lot of your seedlings are, are not going to make it. I've got, uh, I've got a couple of 72 plug trays that I started late and they're, they're just a loss. I think some of the buckwheat might make it. Yeah. All right, now as far as planning in the next great rainforest, that's something that we can actually pull off. Uh, we already talked about this a little bit. Just the simple act of going out and deliberately doing one planting every year uh, on schedule. And then whenever you run out of room for you to plant in your own yard, plant outside and keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Hi, Kitty. Yes, I know. We're doing a live stream. Would you, would you like to say hello to everybody? This is the cat that pooped on the floor, by the way. Yeah. Go away. You bother me. <laughs> so there is a, a, a slight possibility that we might be able to do something like that. Um, 
take the Mississippi River Valley, the, the entire drainage basin of the Mississippi River. What if we started deliberately, intentionally, going out and planting a forest in the Mississippi River Basin? All the way up to the headwaters. Is that something our civilization might be able to pull off? Could be. It's certainly a better legacy than nuclear waste. And if we can figure out some way to get rid of the nuclear waste, that'd be good too. All right. So what's going on out there? Uh, I think I've caught up with all the Shh, slow night. What's going on out there? I've caught up with all the comments. I don't have anything else to say. That's that's the topic. What do you guys think? Yes, no, maybe so. Hmm. Great Wall is no more effective than their watchman. Yeah. Then people can always go around over or under a wall. Hello, Granny Marina. What is it that our civilization is going to contribute whenever we're no longer around? And I guess we could ask the question, are we ever going to actually rise to the point where we become a civilization? Because right now we're, we're pretty much barbarians. Um, barbarians fumbling about in the darkness without really a concept of, of what real civilized, civilized behavior is. Uh, we're still operating off of that off of that basic rule of human behavior, do as I say or, or I will hurt you. And it's compliment, I will do as I'm told or they will hurt me. Sasquatch Red says, I'm hoping our gardens will seed the new forest. Me too. Me too. I'm, I'm learning a lot these days about the starting of pecan trees. I can get them to start from seeds without too much of a problem. So I'll, I'll take the nuts and I'll put them down there and they'll sprout. I've got, well, three this year. I managed to put out, I think, six last year. Now, this year I got three seedlings. But this year I'm also working on trying to figure out how to get them started from cuttings and getting the timing right for the cuttings. It's supposed to be about this time of year, but this year has been weird. Uh, that point where the... <laughs> that point when the, uh, the new growth starts to firm up, Seems to be about the right time to take the cuttings and, and get them started. I've tried one round, didn't get any takers, so I'm getting ready to try another round here in another, another week or so. Because for anywhere from zone five all the way down to about oh zone nine or so, uh, pecans are are a, are a great crop to be growing. All right, buffering hard on your end. Uh, I had a lot of, of lag, like I was watching the screen and. I had a little jerky motion going on over here, so. Who knows, maybe we just have too many people using the internet at once, what do you think? No? Kitty has been scratching herself too much, I'm gonna have to help her out a bit. Vicky says, I've been for some time seriously concerned that our next legacy will be the next great extension event. It very well may be, and it, and it might be done. It might be done uh, accidentally or deliberately. Who knows? Um, there are some dangerous ideas circulating around the world at the moment. Of course, one of the big dangerous ideas is that humans are bad for the planet, and that we should reduce the human population. I, I think this is entirely the wrong approach. I think humans can be very good for the planet. But humans have been acting improperly and don't know what they're doing. So maybe educating humans might be a might be the solution rather than trying to get rid of them. Buffering there too. Yeah. So maybe one of the things that we need to work on is re-educating people. <gasps> Re-education camps. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's gather them all up and teach them. No, 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 no. no. But let's start out with 
with, with, with talking about some of the, some of the basic stuff, like uh, this problem with pollution that we have recently. Uh, for example, you could ask, what is carbon really? And uh, I will tell you, you know, 18% of the human body is carbon by mass, 18%. And all of that had to be carbon dioxide at one time. There's similar ratios for other animals out there. Humans aren't the only ones that are made out of carbon atoms. I mean, little puppy dogs and kittens and chirping birds and whales are made out of carbon atoms in similar ratios. So the entire idea of sequestration of carbon, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, ultimately results in a decreasing the amount of life on the planet. And apparently some people are really against whales and they want to see all the whales killed. Sassafras Red suggesting let the buffalo roam, bring back the prairie dogs, break the levees, let the rivers run their course. It's a nice idea. It's probably not going to happen, unfortunately. Then the question is, do we really need the buffalo roaming? You know, the buffalo were a stopgap measure that the planet put up to replace the original species that was maintaining the savanna lands all, the, all through what's now the Great Plains area. <laughs> Bribe the gatekeepers. There you go. Hmm. So once upon a time, it was, it was pachyderms. We had our own version of the elephant in North America. Uh, of course, the woolly mammoth and the Columbia mammoth ranged all the way down into what's currently South America. And these huge beasts would go through the grasslands and they would, through, through walking around and uprooting trees with their tusks, make sure that the, the forests were not too thick. And so in between islands of trees, there would be plenty of grass for, for all the grazing animals to eat. And of course, their, their, their passing would, would churn the, the surface of the ground, leave behind their dung and cause the, the grasslands to be renewed. Whenever they finally died off, a smaller animal had to take the place of the, the, the herds of, of mammoths. But uh, that would be the, the North American bison. But since the North American bison is nowhere near the size of the mammoth, in order to accomplish the same task, it had to be done with huge, huge herds of them. You know, so many that you can sit there all day watching them go by, and that's how long it takes for that herd to go by. But that's what it takes to maintain a grasslands ecosystem. You have to have those those wandering grazing animals, otherwise you can't do it. So now that we have railroads running across the, uh, the United States from east to west, and we have highway systems running across, and we have people with their own individual properties and fences and everything else, getting that kind of grasslands ecosystem maintenance is not really possible unless, of course, we go in and we act like a grazing animal and do all that work, which we can't really reasonably do. Moose Brat says, would love to air layer my mother-in-law's pecan tree. They're huge. I'm going to have to start trying air layering before too awful long because that might be the only way I can get cuttings to take from them. I'd like to have some actual cuttings of the, of the pecan trees. Of course, the seedlings that I started are doing good so far. I was worried about them at first because of that that late cold snap that we had, but they seem to be bouncing back okay. Planting nuts out will make you squirrely, says Sassafras Red. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think taking lessons from the squirrel is great. Um, let's take a look at what the squirrel does. He, he he goes and he gets his, his his fresh fruits and berries during during the spring months. He's he's out there foraging for fresh food during during the spring. And of course he and the, the Mrs. Squirrel make their babies. This is fun. Um when do they do that? Is it fall that they that they make their babies? I'm not sure. All right. So Mr. and Mrs. Squirrel are out there during the spring, they're foraging. Actually, this is what I'm doing at the moment. Well, not right now, but throughout the spring and early summer. I've been going out to where I've planted my forage vegetables and I'm picking flowers and I'm eating eating my my berries because they're they're right there and they're available. And the way I've got it set up, I've got the I've got the violets early on and the bellflowers. And then we have our 
are Stella de Oro, the, the yellow, and I have, have a peach variety too of, of daylily that make flowers for me. Uh, then as those begin to fade, I get the, the classic orange daylilies. And canna lilies seem to be uh, appearing at the same time, which is really cool. The canna lily flower is not quite as sweet as the, the daylily flower is. It's just more like just a lettuce. But that's fine. I can I can pick the the unopened flower pod of the of the of the uh, hemorrhoid cows full of the classic orange daylily and cook that up like fresh green beans for dinner. So I, I now have not only a breakfast, but I have you know, lunch and dinner being produced as I go and harvest it. All right, let me back up. We have some comments. Uh, Zaspress said, governments are bad for the planet, but my flag may be showing. Oh, I agree. What was it that, that Jefferson said? Governments are at best a necessary evil and at worst an intolerable one. So even at their best, they're still evil. So what we should really be looking for is a way to make them unnecessary. And that's simply a matter of developing the right kind of culture. I think that's possible. We could develop a culture where we actually don't need to have a person in charge. Who knows? Um, Katie says, in response to the title of the question, I intend to leave behind enhanced hu human collective consciousness. Ooh, I like it. We'll have to tell us more about how, you, how you're going to pull that one off. Joe Zerano says, hello, Jason, everybody here in the chat. I see Moonsprout, Cespers Red, Vicky Savage, and Nightbot. Don't worry about Nightbot. Did you know he's related to a toaster? All right. Kylie McGee says, as long as humanity as a whole desperately continues to strive for freedom from all binding institutions. Ooh, hang on. I scrolled up here. From all binding institutions, we will be okay in the long run, in my humble opinion. I, I think the, stri the, the striving towards freedom is, is, is absolutely essential in all, in all aspects, absolutely all aspects. And technology will allow us to thrive through climate crisis. Well, yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do anything particularly about making the planet warmer or cooler, at least not with only seven or eight billion people on planet Earth. Maybe if we've got 40 or 50 billion, we might be able to do something. But seven or eight, that's not really enough to make much of a difference. Um, so we have to work on learning how to adapt instead of imagining that we can wave our hands and go, ooh, it's going to be all better. Because right now, people are imagining that we're making it worse. You can make it really worse in a localized environment. We have places where people are just stacked on top of each other. It's, it's disturbing. Um, yeah, the top 100 most aliens to reveal themselves. The lizard people, right? Oh, no, not the lizard people. Uh, my canna lilies are probably about half the size of David's, but they are in flower now. And we have, as I'm, as I'm discovering, at least two different types of flower. We've got one that's um, yellow on the outside. You know, if you've been at the members, the members, uh, uh, live stream on Monday, you would, I, I, you would have seen them. I, brought, I picked one of them and had, had it that I showed off. But the ones that are currently flowering are yellow petals with orange splotches. Like somebody took took a, 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 a fountain, or not a fountain pen, but you know, one of those quill pens and dipped it in, in dark orange ink and just sort of dropped it around the center of the petal. So they've got little little splotches that are thicker towards the middle and then spotted towards the, towards, towards the edges. Very pretty looking. And then we've got another one coming up that's uh, got a magenta colored petal with uh, sort of a yellow and orange splotching in the middle. And once those open up, uh, I'll get some, some some pictures of them here in the next day or two. I plan on doing a walk by and show off the various the various flowers that we have that are all edible flowers and talk more about that succession from violets in the early spring on to the onto the uh, the smaller daylilies, and then we get the, the bigger daylilies and the canna lilies. And, uh, and keeping my fingers crossed, but hopefully we'll, we're going to have fresh edible flowers all the way through until frost comes. And that'll be, that'll be kind of exciting if we can. Uh, let's see here. 
Of course, David is using his as a chop and drop because they grow so so well. Let me see here. Um, Vicky's wanting to know what parts of the canna lily are edible. The flower itself is edible. The root is edible. And the early shoots in the spring are also edible. So you, if you have lots of shoots and you want to eat those, they're, they're high in protein. So if you're looking for an early spring protein source, the canna lily shoots are great for that. Uh, about this time, we will we will be getting the the flowers that you can add to your to your salads, and I'm not entirely certain what the the nutritional value of them is. I know that if I'm eating uh, a diet of a handful of daylily flowers and a handful of uh, berries about this time of year, it's it's all the energy I need. So they're they're pretty good. Apparently, buffering is a big problem out there tonight. Let's see. Sasquatch Red is saying, when humans cut the forest, drain the rivers, <coughs> and destroy the plants, that just might alter the local climate. Well, it does. Um, we, can, we can accomplish a lot of, 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 of localized climate disaster especially with concentrations of you know, 40, 50,000 per square mile. The, the idea that, that I had earlier when I was talking about um, uh, trying to build a, a more horticultural civilization, getting people to move away from the big population centers and, and start planting trees. Um, I've done a little bit more thinking and calculating and working on it. Uh, with, with the model that we've built up, we know that we can sustain at least 12 people per acre planted with that box of eight pecan trees as the, as the main canopy and then all the supports underneath it. We did that show a while back. Uh, I'm leaning a lot more towards having that model with a, a large pond about 60 feet across in the middle. And that's one acre. And with that, with the adding of the pond and the fish that the pond's going to have and, and things like that, that's going to increase the number that can be supported well beyond 12 per acre. I don't know exactly how many. Beyond 12, probably closer to 20, maybe 24, possibly more. I don't know. But doing that, we do nine acres in a square. Eight around the outside are planted just that way. And then that one acre in the middle, we have that set up as housing. And you could have it at a minimum 92 people to perhaps as many as twice that many, depending upon how many, how old really that, that, that planting is. Once those pecan trees get to be about 40 or 50 years old or older, uh, you can easily double the population that can be supported by them. So at, at a minimum, 92 people in that, that center one acre, that's a small village. You know everybody around. There's plenty of people to take care of the work that needs to be done, and it doesn't take that many people to do the necessary work in harvesting, which means at least half the population can be busy doing other things. Um, for example, industry. We still have industry. We don't have to give up industry, but we can have that very close to our food supply sort of lifestyle. And at that population density, since there are 640 acres per square mile, we could have oh, 7,000 per square mile, which is fairly dense. But not so not so dense that people feel like we're living on top of each other and, and getting stressed from having too many people too close together. Nothing at all like like Cairo with its forty thousand per square mile. And the fun part here is on planet Earth. Oh, hang on a second. Let's ask Nightbot about Earth. Oh, we're waiting for Nightbot to come back. Ooh, Moonsprout says just planted some candle lilies. You're excited. How many do you plant? How many to plant? How many? How many? They're going to be great. You're going to love them. Um, Vicky says, Hosses are like asparagus. The delectable part is the early shoot. I can't wait to try them. Right now, I've just got the new ones started, so I have to let them grow a bit before I start digging into them. Of course, I started a lot of asparagus this year, too. Sasper says, the edible lilies I got from you flowered and fell off quick. Is that normal for the first planting? It's normal in the first planting to not even get a flower at all. So I'm kind of surprised you got flowers, but sometimes they do. Sometimes they will. Uh, give them a couple of years, and then you can start dividing them, and they'll they'll make they'll make good flowers for you. Let's 
All right. Vicky's talking to Sassgrass saying the Amazon basin is a horrible example of how human intervention can alter or destroy a local climate. The damage is balanced on irreversible and being pushed. Keep on going. Um, yeah, and the funny thing is the Amazon basin, as it as it existed before we started cutting into it, a large portion of it was man-made. Well, at least the, the forest part was originally deliberately planted by people trying to grow a forest for food. And it was just so wildly successful, it kept on going and spreading. I think that's amazing. And that's really what I would like to see duplicated here in the Northern Hemisphere, perhaps by our current civilization, if we can ever make the step to becoming a civilization in the first place. All right, so Nightbot says, Earth, the community garden that you are partially responsible for tending has over 196 million square miles of surface area with 24 million square miles that are well suited to horticultural use. 24 million square miles. If our population density can be 7,000 per square mile, then we have 7,000 multiplied by 24 million. That's how many people we can comfortably house on the planet and feed and clothe and take care of and provide medicine for. And it's not counting what comes out of the rivers, lakes, and streams and oceans. Including housing. And of course, there's still all the mountainous regions left. Not even counting the, I think it's 19 million miles worth of, no, 14 million miles worth, worth of mountains. We're not going to live there. I mean, you could. Probably wouldn't be able to get 12 people per acre in a mountain. I don't know how many we could fit onto a mountain. Uh, you go up into the Andes Mountains to see what they did up there. They were able to support a pretty large population. Hmm. All right. Moonsprat says, three rhizomes. Hubby brought them home for me. They're in a large pot right now that plan on spreading them all around. Awesome. Um, they seem to grow pretty well, and they, they're they going to bud and, and reproduce, so you'll be able to divide those pretty quickly. Let's say probably within a year or two, you'll be able to have 9 or 10 or 12 or even more. Um, I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty excited about mine. I was driving along a week before last, and I saw a, a spot where somebody had a big stand of the, uh, I think they're, they're the black ones, they're actually purple, um, canna lilies, and those were just thick, thick, thick. Pretty clear that they had, uh, they had been growing and started from the ground. They hadn't pulled them up at the end of the season. So uh, there's a good chance that we'll be able to keep them in the ground and not have to have to pull them out of the ground every year. That's that I'm excited about that prospect because I hate digging. Uh, I'm not David. <laughs> David loves digging. I hate it. I don't want to do it. Uh, Vicky says, finally got someone to put in my driveway. Nice. Place to park and set up a temporary residence next to try to establish Chinese greenhouse that can afford them and then to set up hydropower. That's awesome. Vicky has, is, 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 is making the, the move onto 100 acres of, of forest in Arkansas. Just wow. Wow, wow, wow. What could you do with 100 acres of forest? Kylie says, just went out the yard and tried to can lily flower. Orange, nice texture, but no flavor that I could tell. Yeah, that's, that's what I noticed. Is it's it's fine. I mean, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't have a bad flavor. It doesn't have a good flavor. It's kind of like eating a lettuce. So whatever whatever flavor your salad dressing imparts to the, to, the, to the salad, that's what you get. And let me see. Currently, most of the best agricultural land is being used as lawns. Yeah. Um, Greg Allison is talking quite frequently. We'll talk about um, the, the use of, of, of lawns. And if we could just convert those lawns across North America into gardens, we could feed the world. A little bit disturbing. I don't know how we get the food from here in North America to the rest of the world. That seems to be a problem. That's one of the major major problems that we actually have. It's not necessarily we can't grow the food, even with modern agriculture, as clumsy and inefficient as modern agriculture is. The problem becomes distribution. How do we get it from here to there? Just, just planting. Oh, what do I have? I've got, ah. 
Can I get that on the camera? Will it focus? There we go. Planting rice. I've got I've got short green rice here. Uh, a, a nice heirloom short grain rice. Uh, we could plant the Arkansas River Valley with this stuff instead of having it full of parking lots and houses, and there would be enough food here to feed the world out of the Arkansas River Valley. Question is, how do we get it to the rest of the world? That's the that's the big problem. So instead of trying to and try to to transport food to the rest of the world, the suggestion is. How about we start getting the people out of these cities where they're stacked on top of each other, 40, 50,000 per square mile, and go to something a little bit more sane, a little bit more sane arrangement, no more than 7,000 per square mile, and then their food is all around them, and you're within walking distance of everything you need other than uh, raw materials that are coming from the places where raw materials are harvested from, obviously small communities, 100 or so within walking distance, easy to get to work for a factory job if you're going to be doing factory jobs, and we can still have industry and factory jobs. Wow, what a concept. So we can still keep on working on developing our science, developing our technology, um, exploring uh, and reaching for the stars. Maybe we'll get off this rock before the sun expands and envelops us all. It's a goal. Sasquatch Red says, I need to rewatch the live stream about tree planting from a month back. We may be buying a new lot. Oh, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, yeah. You, you, you've got a really good paying job doing, doing, that, uh, doing that engineering work. Well, it's good that somebody's buying land and, and, and using it that knows what to do with it. Yeah, I know earlier you said the people that before the Inca, <laughs> for people before the Inca who built the foundations of Andean culture surpassed our abilities. That's, um, yeah, I'm going to go there because I think you're right. I absolutely think you're right. I don't think it was the Incas at all that, that built that in the Andes Mountains. Especially not uh, especially not in the time frame that we're that we're told it happened in. Oh Moon Sprouts is taking off. Bye Moon Sprouts. Thanks for stopping by. Because well let's think about this. Up there in the Andes Mountains, you can go walking up there. And within about five or ten minutes of walking, you're completely out of breath. You got a breath because the atmosphere is too thin. So what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that if somebody was going to be building, even with modern equipment back then, or at some point in the past, the air had to be more dense, or they had to bring supplemental oxygen with them, either one. That's not Incan civilization. Incan doesn't have supplemental mineral oxygen, and the time, that the carbon dating for the Incan civilization doesn't match the time when the atmosphere was that dense. So it had to predate the Incan civilization. That's all there is to it. It had to predate the Incan civilization. And whenever the Spanish came through and started asking people, hey, who built this? The natives told them. The giants did it. Now, I don't know if that means literal giants, like really, really big people, or, well, I mean, somebody who's seven foot tall, if I'm five foot tall, that's a giant as far as I'm concerned. That's a giant. I'm going to do a little segment here, uh, not too long ago, or not too long ago, not too long from now, uh, regarding the Anasazi beans. I, I want to talk a little bit about about that ancient culture. Um, where do I want to start in at? I think let's start. Up, let's, let's start with Rhodes. Um, the contribution that Rome made to, to to civilization, although Rome was never civilized, the contribution that Rome made was uh, roads. The, the main thing that made Rome so successful was roads. It was a novel concept. And we still use roads to this day. And in some ways, they act a lot like the Roman roads because whoever controls them really uh, runs roughshod over the rest of us. <laughs> but 
Rome, incidentally, was not the only ancient civilization to come up with the concept of roads. Uh, the Incans had 60, 70,000 miles or more of roads that they used that, as we've just previously discussed, probably weren't even built by the Incans. They were built by whoever was there before the Incans arrived. Possibly the ancestors of the Incans, or maybe whoever built them moved on or died out, and then the Incans moved in and took up took up that, that, that position. I don't know. But they built roads, large numbers of roads, and those roads are still visible today. The Anasazi culture in uh, New Mexico. Roads connect all the Pueblo sites together. There's a Mrs. Cosmic Cultivators? Hey, cool. Well, hello, Mrs. Cosmic Cultivators. Glad to see you could make it. Uh, oh, oh, Sean says, not an engineer. Thank you. I'm a hammer swinging foul mouth union bridge builder. <laughs> Aim into that. Hmm. My ex father in law was, uh, was one of those uh, engineering types. He actually ran the company that, that, put together the plans and oversaw the construction of, of major projects that required specialized tools and equipment. I said most of most of the money that he made got spent on tools so that he could work on the next job. So he was always he was always running at a deficit. Nice house in in, uh, in Redwood, but always in debt. All right, so Anasazi built roads. Um, the Anasazi were, oh, I was, I was talking to Joe about this, just around. Uh, we don't really actually know who the Anasazi people were. It's speculated that the, the modern day Zuni Pueblo and Hopi might have been Anasazi, but this is not the case, and I can, I can prove it to you. Because among the many things that I keep on my bookshelves includes, well, this, which is the only actually authorized version of Hopi history and mythology from the Hopi people. <laughs> and that story isn't in here. There's an entirely different story for the, the last great destruction of, of humanity that, uh, I'm not going to open up the book and read it because at this point the book is about to fall apart. So we'll just put this someplace where it'll be more or less safe. Um, uh, incidentally, the, the, the last great destruction was a flood, according to, to, to the Hopi story. So if we were timing that probably around yeah, 12,000 or so years ago, 10,800 BC, give or take, plus or minus a couple hundred years. Um, that would have been that would have been whenever the whenever all the all the world civilizations experienced the great flood, and everybody has their story about it. Kind of interesting. Inga Roads is a great song. Yeah, I imagine the world did look quite a bit different. All right, so going back to the, to the Anasazi, who we actually still are not entirely certain who they were. We know that at some point. They were they were living out in the open. The, the the pueblos were you know pueblos or cities, but they lived out in the open. People could come in and come in and go and come and go. As lots of traffic along the roads. They speculate the roads might have been ceremonial. I think they were probably practical. In all actuality, I mean, how many things do we have that are ceremonial? Most of it's actually practical. All right, and they were raising a lot of corn. They were raising a lot of corn and they were exporting a lot of corn. And the corn that they raised wound up all over the world. How did it get there? Well, they had roads, remember? <laughs> At some point, the smell of my shoes, that's why I'm leaving, says Zachary Pinnegar. Ah, well, that's better than some things that could be left behind, that's for sure. At some point, a group of people came in, I suspect from the south. I don't know who these people were exactly, but they invaded the Anasazi villages and started killing and eating people. Um, we know this because going through the remains at Chaco, 
we can find the evidence of cannibalism. What this evidence doesn't tell us is who those people were. Uh, the Navajo don't want to talk about it, <laughs> but I don't think I don't think it was the Navajo either. I think they they don't want to talk about it because they don't want to be blamed and, and being seen as those people that were running around eating people. But I think it was an entirely different culture. I think it was an entirely different group of people. And after they were done at Chaco, the other people that fled from that area started building the cliff, cliff dwellings to escape. So now you're up at the cliff. You've got one little tiny donkey track leading up to where you're living. And these invaders that want to kill you and eat you can't do it. So the invaders moved on to hopefully uh, well, what they thought were uh, easier to prey upon people. And they wound up, as far as I can tell, moving northwest and winding up uh, in Nevada, where the Paiute live. And this is this is this is why it's unfortunate that a lot of natives don't exchange stories, because the Paiute have a wonderful story about a group of, of what they call giants that moved in uh, to their region and started attacking and killing and eating people. And after many attempts by the Paiute to talk them into behaving like civilized folk, civilized folk incidentally means we understand the basic rule of civilization, which is I don't harm you and you don't harm me. This group of people didn't understand this. They thought it was okay for them to initiate violence, and so they did. And eventually the pilots got enough of it, and they uh, they started fighting back. And although the giants were large, the pilots were numerous, and they were able to drive the, the invaders to the point where they took shelter in, in a cave at Lovelock, and at that point they were uh, they were eradicated. That's That's the story of how the giants met their end. In North America. Where can you find the Hopi book? Um, Amazon, if you're lucky. Uh, it's 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 a, it's an old book. I mean, really old. It's written by Frank Waters. He 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 lived amongst the the Hopi people for an extended period of time, and they shared their stories and traditions with him. And yeah, I'm I'm just not even going to open it at the moment. The pages are about to fall apart. It really should be hermetically sealed or at least copied off somewhere. Very, very interesting read if you're looking at, 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 at tales being told by indigenous peoples about the times before. And I'm really, really interested in the tales told by indigenous peoples of the times before because there's some really interesting similarities from, from one, one culture's story to another culture's story. But it indicates to me that either one, all these people were sharing the same civilization at one point in the distant past. In other words, a global civilization. Or two, the very real events were happening that made changes in the earth and they were around to witness them. And then we can look at the geological record and realize, oh, wow, humanity is a lot older than we thought it was. Um, yes, one, one of the... Zachary is mentioning the, the Hopi saying they went underground in caves for hundreds of years. That was prior to the prior to the flood flood, flood event. There was a time when the world was destroyed. They, they described it as the world was destroyed, and then then there's a new world. Uh, of course, if your entire civilization crumbles, then you're you're seeing your world destroyed. So everybody has that. Um, all right. So the Hopi say they went underground in caves for hundreds of years. So much of the Aztecs. Um, they referred to the people that they took shelter with as the ant people. So the Hopi distinguished themselves as being different from the from the culture that had the, the cave systems that took them in. Apparently, there was some reason why they had to take shelter underground. Now, this is interesting because over there in, in Turkey, you're going to find extensive man-made caves and labyrinths dug out of, of, of welded, tough volcanic rock. Very easy to carve, but still sturdy enough that you can build extensive cities, cities that can hold tens of thousands of people underground. Um, could these have been the ant people? Or maybe somebody like them? Could those have been the so-called ant people? Why do we call them ant people? Because they built their cities underground, right? Not that they look like ants, although in the drawings they look like ants. What can you expect? 
<laughs> They're the ant people, so we draw them as ants. Uh, you, you see that uh, in, a, in a lot of other cases where if a people were said to have come from the sky, they're depicted as having the heads of birds or having wings. Even though chances are they did not have the heads of birds and they probably did not have wings, that's just the representation that says these people came from the sky. And, and if you're, you're thinking aliens coming and visiting planet Earth, I don't think so. I, I, I believe the Fermi paradox is, is, uh, is, is, is fairly an accurate description. Sure, yeah, in the universe is big. There's probably intelligent life out there, but the chances of, of us ever encountering it, a little semicircle that forms the, the lower end of the Rocky Mountains, got pushed up on the seaward side. And as a result, you no longer had the ocean coming up in through that area. And the uh, the result was the, the Great Salt Lake dried and the Bonneville Salt Class were formed. Of course, there's still a little bit of water in the Great Salt Lake. But somewhere between the 40,000 and, and 14,000 years ago, all of that would have dried up. So there would not have been that flow of fresh water coming in and seasonal rains to fuel that civilization. So how old was it really? It was a lot older than I think we're, we're, we're giving them credit for. It. Vicky's saying the Smithsonian Institute stash has been caught repeatedly destroying evidence that countered their narrative. Isn't that sad? I mean, if it's true, I don't know that it is. But if it is true, very sad. Although, I think a lot of stuff just gets archived and forgotten about. But they're certainly not going to show stuff that... that uh, throws egg on the face of somebody with, with college tenure. So our knowledge of, of the past and archaeology has to wait for a bunch of people to die. <laughs> and then, then we can go, oh, yeah, and by the way, here we go. All right, Zach, oh, let me see. I saw that the people had a farm when the people came up into the fourth world. That's kind of an interesting, interesting statement. Because that knowledge of how to farm, the knowledge of agriculture, seems to be something that was brought by the sky people, whoever those people were. And they taught agriculture. And then they disappeared. Possibly because if you run your civilization off of agriculture, it's not going to stay around very long. Oh, staff. Okay. I think it says staff, not stash. Well, stash works too, right? <laughs> they, they've got a stash of artifacts. Uh, Atlan. Astlan. Okay. Uh, Aztec people said stayed in the caves 300 years after the other people emerged from the caves. Interesting. Okay. So we have that concept of the uh, the Aztec underworld, and a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the mythology revolves around that. And we have a tendency to sort of dismiss the tales of indigenous people because, oh, yeah, they're just making up stories, right? I don't know why. We all have our stories. Maybe the solar weather is messing with the Internet. Could be. Could be. I don't know. The world is far, far older. This is uh, Sasquatch Red saying the world is far older than 6,000 years. The foundation of our knowledge of history is based on the idea of a 6,000 year old history. Um, a six, well, if we, if we, if we go to, to 6,000 BC, it becomes an 8,000 year old history. But what were, what were they using to, to, to write with before the Sumerians started dibbling into clay with styluses? If it was, if it was, if it was paper, papyrus reeds or or even pounded wood paper pages of paper if it was parchment none of that lasts that long if it was digital recording medium it would last even you know, a shorter amount of time uh, it seems weird that we talk about digital recording me medium and prehistory but where did the sky people come from <laughs> if they could come from the sky 
if they could come from the sky and if that if that if that those stories were true told by numerous civilizations in their own histories and mythologies down through the ages that people came from the skies if that's true then then well they could have had digital recording media couldn't they the record in genesis of the adam was made to tend the garden that's that's the idea placed here placed here in the eden if you're following the sumerian story to to serve the will of the gods or to serve the god elohim depending upon where you're getting your your, your original source material uh if mankind's purpose is to serve the guard or to, is, is to tend the garden and that's the reason why we're here if we're going to follow the the, the judeo-christian line then what would be mankind's first commandment that was given to, given to him by the deity? Tend the garden. What's mankind specifically not doing a lot of these days? And why do we have the problems we have? Just saying. Maybe there's a point to it. Just maybe. So, we're past... Let me see. Ask the Dogen tribes about that 6,000-year history. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I thought that I thought those, those stories were kind of interesting because they were, they were pointing northwards. They were indicating a northwards direction and, and showing them how to follow the stars to where they came from. And the, the interpretation that we get is that they came from the stars. That might not have necessarily been true. They may have just been saying, if you follow these stars, they will guide you north to where we live. Maybe. Just saying. I'm not going to rule out the possibility of aliens, but it's the least likely possibility. I, th I think an advanced human civilization in, in antiquity probably is more likely. Maybe. In any case, we have been going for well over an hour, and we've talked a little bit about those those weird ancient civilizations that came before us, that the... the of course, the, the, the concept that we are actually really not civilized ourselves yet, we still have to learn that one basic rule of law, which is, I will not harm you and you will not harm me, as opposed to do as I say or I will hurt you. We, we need to abandon that, that, that antiquated way of thinking and start adapting a new, a new modern way of thinking, which may actually have been the old way of thinking, uh, which would allow us to become a civilized people. And then at some point, possibly, maybe, as a civilized people, we might have a legacy that we can pass on that future generations can look at and say, now that, that was a great civilization there. And who knows, maybe our civilization will last for the 20 or 30,000 years that it will take to do something fun like chart the procession of the equinoxes. Maybe. In any case, we've gone on for over an hour. I hope you found the video informative or entertaining, possibly both. If you know, you do know what to do. And I will, of course, catch you next time. And uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight, guys. It's been fun. Well, let's do it again next week.